Uh, Julie. Hi, the, my first question, and I have three, so thanks for all the amazing pro, uh, presentations. My first one is to uh, Mr. Lemaire. Mr. Lemaire, uh, we're talking about uh, you know, self-sufficiency moving forward. I want to talk to you about labor. In uh, the produce sector, there te- there's traditionally been an issue around labor. Before COVID-19, uh, in a typical year, and you just give me a ballpark number, what percentage uh, of the labor uh, was filled by migrants? And in a typical year, did you still, even with migrants filling your labor, in a typical year, did you still have labor shortages? Right. So it's a great question. And uh, I'll give you an idea, out of all the temporary foreign workers that are uh, coming to Canada in horticulture, they represent about 72% of all of that labor force. Mm -hmm. So that's very significant. You're looking at over uh, 32 to uh, 33,000 workers. And that is below the requirements that the industry needs at the farm level and through some of the supply chain. Um, It's been a big challenge, especially at the beginning with the uh, disruption to access because of uh, travel restrictions. Mm -hmm. And it's recovered, but still a gap. So, so t- to what extent do you actually think that pushing students or even adults to work in these industries when they weren't filling <laughs> these positions <laughs> in the past, to what extent do you actually think any type of encouragement is actually going to be helpful? So that's one portion of the supply chain, right, of, at, on the farm. And it's a hard sell. It, it really is. It's, it's manual, physical labor that, labor that we are having a hard time convincing Canadians to do. But there's other parts. There's repackers. There's wholesale. There are... Uh, other components within the logistics section of our of our operations that can leverage Canadians to get them involved. And those are the guys that are finding gaps and finding challenges because of the uh, workforce absenteeism. You have a suspected case of COVID, 30% of a workforce doesn't show up to a greenhouse repacking facility in BC the following day. How do they fill that? How do they continue to support business continuity? So I have one more question for you. Uh, one of the ideas that I think is being tossed around, at least I heard this publicly today, is I think uh, potentially looking at non-status um, asylum uh, 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 seekers who are here in Canada or those who, who are non-status workers, maybe they had a permit before, but it ran out. Would you be open to some sort of, if, if we were looking at some sort of a way for maybe some of the non-status workers we have here, find a legitimate way to maybe get them a work permit if they would be willing to fill uh, positions that that we desperately need them to fill. Is that an idea that you think your sector might be willing to uh, to look at? I think that would be something that uh, we could consider. Uh, we'd have to go through logistics and uh, how that would work, but definitely something we could look at. Okay, that sounds great. My next question is to Miss Greenwood. Miss Greenwood, um, I was uh, interested in your common cross manufacturing uh, sort of proposal. I just want to quickly ask you two questions. Um, and one is, how is the border... Uh, how's the border working right now? And are are there any improvements that you think we need to be making now or sort of ongoing that you think we need to be thinking about? Uh, Thank you very much for the question. The border is working. So the border was closed to uh, non-essential commerce, but remained open to essential commerce. And it works uh, extremely well if you're in a tractor trailer, uh, if you're in a, a train car. Uh, So so critical supplies are going back and forth, and I think both governments um, have done a very good job on that. Uh, There have been some other instances, though, where it wasn't clear. Uh, Border agents have a lot of discretion about what they determine is essential commerce or not. So so there have been some instances where someone was turned away, uh, but but actually they should have been allowed um, to go forward. Uh, So our idea idea for that is an essential commerce designation uh, where governments could, and we, we actually have a, a pilot project idea uh, for, for this, where governments, just, just like you have a trusted traveler designation, you could have an essential commerce designation. It could also be used for resumption of commerce after this, where you would add a health uh, element to the screening. So, so the border's going pretty well, uh, but it's not perfect, and we, we think we have a solution uh, to propose. 
Okay, great. And then Ms. Gray, if I could just quickly ask you one quick question. Uh, you were talking about one of the solutions moving forward in terms of self-sufficiency uh, is capital funding for innovation. Since time immemorial in our country, we have tried to be even more innovative every single time, every government tries successively. What is the one thing you think we could do differently this time that just might get us to be an extraordinarily innovative and productive <laughs> country? Well, uh, we do have some great uh, innovation in our country, uh, for sure. And uh, there's been lots of studies done by very smart people looking at, at how we become a more innovative economy. So I'm not going to speak to that um, specifically, but I do chair the board of MyTax. And so I'll kind of throw that out there, which has obviously um, a great uh, relationship between governments, business and the university and academic sector for funding research internships. And much of that work does eventually become commercialized in some small scale. But the issue I was speaking about today was something actually just much more basic than that, which is when we have the technology in Canada, why are we not actually adopting and using that technology as opposed to forcing our Canadian innovators to try to find Asian markets or um, investors for their uh, products and technologies. And I threw out a few examples. So just something as simple as why are there not electric buses on the streets of Winnipeg, but there are in California. Um, those buses are made here in Manitoba. Um, why are we not you know, adopting something as simple as nurses wearing, having wristwatches that can automatically tell the temperature of patients? $150 manufactured here in Manitoba. So just a few ideas. Right. But in some cases, governments have to lead the way because a lot of the innovation is in the healthcare or related sector.